My name is Omar Ben Reyes. Ebony Janice Moore. All Girl Fanel. I am originally from Pakistan. California. Massachusetts. Journalist. Banker. A high school teacher. Organic food developer. Unitarian Universalist, Baptist, and Muslim. Interfaith. Mormon. Muslim. Sikh. Multi related. Educating people about religious freedom now is the most important thing that we have to do in our country today. Religious freedom just means plainly the freedom and the ability to practice my religion or any religion without um, backlash. One of the basic freedoms a human being should have. There's a phrase I've heard, I really wish I could remember who said this, but um, it's not religious freedom at all unless it's religious freedom for all. And I think that's part of what just makes it so important. I think the Religious Freedom Center is training an army of leaders. It's really not about talking about things, it's about getting people acting on things. Having the opportunity to meet people of so many different and diverse backgrounds, um, whether that's religious, racial, um, economic, um, just geographic, being able to have everyone in one place and in the nation's capital has just been so invaluable. This does not have to be a wedge issue. This does not have to be a partisan issue. This can be an issue that actually builds bridges uh, between people of good faith, whether that faith is religiously grounded or not, to make a better civil society. The Religious Freedom Center. I think it has the potential to be, and is in my mind, the nerve center for religious freedom in our country. You too can become a constitutional and human rights specialist focusing on religious freedoms. Check out religiousfreedomcenter.org to learn more and to apply for courses in the First Amendment. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kristen Looney, and I'm the interim administrator of the Religious Freedom Center of the Newseum Institute. I want to extend a very warm welcome to all of you who have joined us this evening. A very special welcome to our distinguished guests and all those of you who are watching live stream. We are thrilled that you have joined us this evening. I also want to give a very special recognition to our partners at the Alliance Defending Freedom, without whom this event would not have happened. Day in and day out, the Religious Freedom Center focuses on educating the American public about the First Amendment especially freedom of religion, freedom of conscience. We are thrilled to have the opportunity to host this moot court event on this landmark case, Masterpiece Cake Shop v. Colorado Civil Rights Commission, which the U.S. Supreme Court will hear on December 5th. The big questions that arise in this case, freedom of expression, freedom of conscience, and protection from discrimination, are at the heart of who we are as Americans. And we know that communities across the country will feel the impact of this decision. And so we are very grateful that you have come out tonight on this cold fall evening from your busy lives to learn more about this case and what is at stake. And so now to help set the stage tonight, I want to invite Carrie Kupek, who is the Director of Communications for ADF. She will come up and help set the stage. So please help me in giving her a very warm welcome. Thank you, Kristen. Good evening. As Kristen mentioned, my name is Carrie Kupak. I am the Director of Communications and Legal Counsel with Alliance Defending Freedom. For those of you who are not familiar with Alliance Defending Freedom, ADF is the world's largest legal organization that advocates for religious freedom. We have an extensive Supreme Court practice, having won five cases in the last th three years involving issues of free speech and religious freedom. And we are pretty excited over at ADF today 
because just this morning, the Supreme Court granted review in another one of our cases, Nifla v. Becerra, and this is a First Amendment free speech case that addresses whether pregnancy centers, pro-life pregnancy centers, must advertise abortion to the women they are counseling. And this case could be argued as early as late February. But that is not why we are here today. We are here for different free speech and religious freedom reasons. And I'd like to thank the Religious Freedom Center of the Museum Institute for their wonderful partnership and sponsorship of this event, specifically to Kristen Looney, who you just saw up here, and to the ACLU and our journalist moderators for coming together with us and providing what we hope will be a helpful and enlightening conversation about some of the most important legal and cultural issues of our time. Masterpiece Cake Shop, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission. Cake, conscience, equal rights, and creative professionals. What does it all mean? The facts are fairly simple. Jack Phillips is a Colorado cake artist who serves all customers but doesn't create custom cakes that celebrate all events or express all messages. In 2012, a gay couple asked Jack to create a custom cake for their same-sex wedding ceremony. Because of his religious beliefs about marriage, Jack politely declined the opportunity, offering to sell them anything else in his shop. The couple sued Jack under Colorado law, and the U.S. Supreme Court will hear arguments in this case on December 5th. This case raises issues that truly strike at the heart of American civil society. What does tolerance in a free and pluralistic society look like? What civil rights are at stake? Can one support same-sex marriage and artists like Jack Phillips? And what is the road ahead? Well, here today to guide us through the questions are two top-notch civil rights attorneys and a panel of, na of national Supreme Court journalists. Let's... Do you want to... Dave and Rhea, would you like to make your way up? Great. <laughs> Dave Cortman is Senior Counsel and Vice President of U.S. Litigation at Alliance Defending Freedom. Dave joined ADF in 2005 and currently supervises a team of nearly 40 attorneys and legal staff who specialize in constitutional law. Dave has successfully litigated hundreds of constitutional law cases in all levels of federal and state court, including the U.S. Supreme Court. Specifically, some of you may remember that in 2015, Dave successfully argued Reed v. Town of Gilbert, which was a free speech case involving signs and churches, and that resulted in a 9-0 decision from the court. And just this past year, he argued the Trinity Lutheran Playground case, which resulted in a 7-2 victory for the church preschool. Dave has appeared as a guest and has written opinion pieces for numerous major media outlets. He earned his JD from Regent University School of Law, graduating magna cum laude. He is a member of the State Bar in Georgia, Florida, Arizona, and the District of Columbia, and is admitted to practice in over two dozen federal courts, including the U.S. Supreme Court. Rhea Tobacco Mar. Rhea is a staff attorney with the American Civil Liberties Union, and she is specifically with the Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and HIV Project. Rhea, uh, her litigation docket covers a wide range of issues affecting the equal rights of LGBT people, and in 2016, she was named one of the best LGBT lawyers under 40 by the National LGBT Bar Association. Prior to joining the ACLU, Rhea served as assistant counsel at the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, where she participated regularly as amicus parties on cases involving marriage equality and was a member of the board of directors of the New York Civil Liberties Union. She served as a law clerk to Judge Victor Marrero of the U.S. District Court for the Southern District of New York and to Judge Julia Smith Gibbons of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Sixth Circuit. She went to NYU School of Law and Harvard for undergrad. Would you join me in welcoming our attorneys tonight? Next, I'd like to move on to our panel of moderators. And just to be clear, uh, our moderators will not be taking votes or positions on the arguments made tonight, but they will certainly be facilitating a wonderful conversation that I hope you all will enjoy. And I'd like to note that both Adam Liptak and Alex Sawyer are also attorneys as well. Al Adam Liptak, Adam, he covers the U.S. Supreme Court and writes Sidebar, a column on legal developments at the New York Times. A graduate of Yale Law School, he practiced law for 14 years before joining the New York Times new staff in 2002. He was a finalist for the 2009 Pulitzer Prize in Explanatory Reporting. 
He has taught courses on the Supreme Court and the First Amendment at several law schools, including Yale and the University of Chicago. Next to Adam, we have Mark Sherman. Mark is a journalist for the Associated Press, and he's covered the Supreme Court for the Associated Press since 2006, a period that has included some blockbuster decisions on health care and same-sex marriage and big changes in the court's membership. He has previously written about the Justice Department, health care, and national politics in more than 25 years as a reporter based in Washington, D.C. and Atlanta. Earlier in his professional life, Mark worked for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. He, he was briefly a Foreign Service officer and served as a copy boy at the New York Times. Adam, do you remember seeing Mark there? We, we tried to put it together and we can't quite figure it out. I don't doubt him though. <laughs> Mark is a native of Brooklyn, New York, just like Rhea. Actually, Rhea lives there now and, uh, and is a graduate of Princeton University. Next, we have Rich Wolf. Rich has been a USA Today reporter and editor for three decades and has covered all three branches of the federal government. He has been the Supreme Court correspondent since 2012. He covered the White House during the Bush and Obama administrations and spent a decade reporting on Congress, as well as five years as the newspaper's congressional editor. He also has reported on the federal budget and economics, health care and welfare policy, state and local governments, and national politics. Before joining USA Today, he was a Washington correspondent for Gannett News Service and a reporter and editor at Gannett Newspapers in New York. Last but certainly not least, we have Alex Sawyer with the Washington Times. Originally from Texas, Alex left the Lone Star State to attend the Missouri School of Journalism, where she graduated with a bachelor's degree in journalism with an emphasis in broadcast. She has experience covering stories in the mid-Missouri, Houston, and southwest Florida areas where she worked at, a local, at local affiliate TV stations and received a first place mark of excellent awards from the Society of Professional Journalists. After graduating from law school in Florida, she decided to leave the courtroom and return to the newsroom as a legal affairs reporter for the Washington Times. Would you join me in welcoming our moderators tonight? Mr. Portman. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice, and may it please the court. The First Amendment has long protected citizens from being forced by the government to speak a message or to create art celebrating ideas that they disagree with. And it does not matter whether that decision uh, is popular or not. It is precisely unpopular decisions about speech that need the most protection. The question in this case is whether this long-standing principle will falter in the face of heavy cultural pressure. Jack Phillips is a cake artist that lives out his faith in every area of his life, including his small family business. He has named it Masterpiece Cake Shop because it incorporates the fact that God is his master and to remind him of the scripture that says you cannot serve both God and money. He closes Masterpiece Cake Shop on Sundays to engage in religious worship. He also helps his employees financially and in any way that he can, both inside and outside of work. He treats all of his customers with respect and dignity. And while Jack gladly serves everyone, and this cannot be overstated, he does not create any custom work that expresses messages or celebrates events in violation of his beliefs. As examples, he does not create any art or messages promoting Halloween, or that oppose the family, or America, or that contain alcohol, nor can he celebrate with any custom creation, any marriage other than between one man and one woman. For Jack and for many others, marriage is sacred and the wedding is an inherently religious ceremony. Jack believes, as do many others, that marriage represents the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church. And Jack also personally invests himself in the artistic design of his custom cake creations. He personally delivers the cake to the wedding and often interacts with the guests. His decision not to celebrate a same-sex wedding ceremony event was found to be in violation of Colorado's public accommodation law. Yet the act states that there is only a violation when a business owner refuses to serve someone based on a protected characteristic. And respondents argument that public com accommodation laws are generally permissible because they regulate conduct is unremarkable as no one disputes this. But what they ignore is the fact that this court has held that when they are applied to expression, such as in this case, they violate the First Amendment rights in the Constitution. And while Jack gladly serves everyone, including the complainants here, his decision was not based on who the person was, but on the fact that he cannot promote every message or every event regardless of who the person is. Yet the double standard in enforcing this law is exemplified in this case. 
In fact, the same commission who ordered Jack to promote a view of marriage that he disagrees with has found that three other cake shop owners not to have violated the same exact law, even though they refused a Christian man's request for a cake opposing same-sex marriage on religious grounds. And the reason given by the commission was that the refusal was not based on his protected characteristic of being religious, which protects broadly all manner of beliefs and actions, but rather was based on his refusal not to oppose that message opposing same-sex marriage. Jack, even though he declined for the same reasons, his justification was rejected. This inconsistent application of the law is not only based on the content of the message, but it also favors people with one particular view, both of which this court has found unconstitutional. This court has also held that compelling speech violates the First Amendment. And in fact, the lower court's order that is up on review only worsens the compelled speech at issue here. Number one, it forces Jack to promote any message in a custom-created cake for a marriage for every other marriage. This means including writing on a cake the words, for example, God bless this marriage, or including two figurines on top of the cake of two men or two women, or certain other expression, such as the rainbow filling used by the complainants here, all which clearly express a message. The order also requires Jack to re-educate his employees, many of which are his family, to correct his incorrect views and beliefs, according to the government. And if that weren't enough, he has to regularly report to the government his decision on which messages or events he chooses not to promote. Each aspect of the lower court's order compels speech in violation of Jack's rights. But more importantly, though, this case is not solely about same-sex marriage. It is not about whether one supports it or opposes it. It is about the principle about whether everyone can continue exercising their expressive and artistic freedom without government compulsion, regardless of the issue at hand. That is why out of the nearly 50 friend of the court briefs that were filed in support of Jack, many of those briefs are from people and organizations who support same-sex marriage, but also understand at the same time the importance of Jack's rights and others not to create art celebrating ideas that conflict with his own. That right, that principle, protects everyone regardless of their views, their beliefs, or the subject matter. Because the principle issued by this court in today's case will not be limited to the issue of marriage. It will apply across the board to any views that may implicate the growing list of protected categories in various public accommodation laws throughout the country. Just some of those categories include gender expression, personal appearance, family responsibilities, and political affiliation. Yet it's not hard to envision countless scenarios in which a potential client will ask an artist to create custom work that may implicate uh, any of these classifications. For example, such as when a lesbian graphic designer is asked to create a church flyer opposing a gay pride event, or a democratic speech writer is asked to create a speech for a Republican. Respondents' new rule will require that they do so in violation of the First Amendment. But there is a better way, one that allows the Commission to ensure that businesses cannot refuse to serve people simply because of who they are, but also at the same time does not permit an unconstitutional application of these laws that force people to speak a message that violates their conscience. Thank you. Ms. Mar. Good evening, and may it please the court. My name is Ria Mar of the ACLU, and I represent respondents Charlie Craig and David Mullins. In the summer of 2012, Dave Mullins and Charlie Craig were planning their wedding. It was a happy time, and one of the details they were excited about was the cake. Charlie's mom, Debbie, was planning to be in town that summer, so they decided to wait for her to choose their cake. But what should have been a special day became memorable for all the wrong reasons, when Masterpiece Cake Shop refused even to discuss a cake with them, because Dave and Charlie are a gay couple. The bakery's owner told them that he would bake no cake of any kind for their wedding reception. The family was shocked. As Debbie has said, we went into that store happy, we left broken. What happened that day was devastating for Dave and Charlie and Debbie, but it wasn't complicated. Colorado law provides that retail stores open to the public can't refuse to serve customers based on factors including race, religion, and sexual orientation. This equal service rule is not new. It's been the law in Colorado since 1885. The places of public accommodation can't turn away customers based on who they are. It's easy for many of us to take for granted the ability to walk into a store, a bank, or a hotel and know that we won't be refused service. But without that guarantee, many of us would go about our daily lives with uncertainty and fear of being turned away. 
anti-discrimination laws are intended to vindicate that deprivation of personal dignity that comes from being told your dollar isn't good enough. The bakery seeks a constitutional right to deny equal service in violation of Colorado's Anti-Discrimination Act, but the Supreme Court has never accepted that theory. It has rejected the constitutional right to discriminate claims of entities ranging from law firms and labor unions to private schools and universities to restaurants and hotels. Retail bakeries should fare no differently. Nevertheless, the bakery argues that their usual rules don't apply to it because its custom wedding cakes are a form of art. No one disputes that cakes can be artistic, but discriminating against customers when selling an artistic product has nothing to do with the freedom of speech. The bakery's owner compares himself to Jackson Pollock. If Colorado passed a law saying that no artist may splatter paint on canvases, that would raise a First Amendment problem. But that does not mean that the state can't regulate the sale of paint splattered on canvases when it's offered to the public at large. If Jackson Pollock had opened a retail gallery in Colorado and offered his paintings for sale to the general public, he could not refuse to sell a painting to a customer because she is black or Christian or gay. And the same is true of the bakery. The Anti-Discrimination Act does not tell the bakery how to design its cakes. It does not even require the bakery to make cakes at all. The law simply says that if the bakery chooses to offer a product to the public at large, it can't refuse to sell that same product to a customer <clears throat> simply because of her race, her religion, her sexual orientation, or certain other aspects of her identity. The fact that the bakery's refusal was based on its owner's religious beliefs does not excuse its discrimination either. Religious liberty is one of our most cherished freedoms, but it does not give anyone the right to harm others in violation of a generally applicable state law. The implications of the bakery's claim are staggering. If the bakery has its way, it could refuse to serve not only a gay couple, but an interracial couple as well. Let that sink in. And that's not all. A barbershop could refuse to cut a boy's hair for his bar mitzvah because of its opposition to the Jewish faith. A tailor could refuse to alter a suit for a woman because of its belief that women should not work outside the home. And a florist could refuse to sell an arrangement to Jim Obergefell for his husband's funeral because of its opposition to same-sex relationships. Fortunately, that is not the law. And for the past five years, Dave Mullins and Charlie Craig have fought to keep it that way and make sure that no one has to go through what they did. At every step of the way, the courts have agreed that what happened to Dave and Charlie was discrimination, and there's no excuse, constitutional or otherwise, for that conduct. Now the bakery is asking the Supreme Court to rule for the first time that there is a constitutional right to discriminate. This case is not about the cake. It's about a rule that has been the law in Colorado for more than a century, that when we walk into a store that's open to the public, we can't be turned away because of who we are or who we love. Thank you. I guess I'll ask the first question. Mr. Cortman, what is the limit here? I mean, if a Jewish a couple walked into the bakery and wanted a cake to celebrate their Jewish wedding and Mr. Phillips had an objection, could he refuse to serve them as well? Well, I think the, um, the, the principle here is, is, is whether the message is expressive or not. And I think that's the difference between the argument that's put forth by respondents uh, in the briefing here, and that is what the argument is is they're refusing to serve someone based on who they are, and that's simply not the case. But there has to be I think the Chief Justice's question was let's, let's assume it's expressive. It, it expresses approval of a Jewish wedding, and the baker doesn't like Jewish weddings. May the baker decline to bake the case? Only if it's separated from the protected status. And this is an important point. Because when you look at the Hurley case, the same exact argument was made as is being made in this case. And what they said in Hurley is, is, is you won't let this contingency, this gay pride contingency, in the parade. And that's based on sexual orientation. And what the court said, no, you have to separate those two things. There was no objection to individual um, homosexuals participating in the parade. It was just to the message. So, so the answer to the question is, if it's based on the protected status of the person, that is who they are, then it's not permissible. If it's based on a separate message, we don't want to, we don't want to impose that message on the speaker, uh, then it can be refused. And that's an important distinction here. Okay. But if I understand your answer, so long as it's the message of disapproval of Jewish weddings, the baker can refuse 
to bake a cake. Well, it may be so, but it depends on, on who it is and why. And the reason that I say that is it's, it's not, it may be a separate objection to, for example, if there are uh, Orthodox Jews that only believe Jewish people can be married um, or something like that. That may be protective. If it's simply a person saying, because of your religion, I won't marry you or, or I won't recognize the wedding, then the answer is no, they cannot do so. So it, it has to be, again, separate from the protected status of the person, and that's important in this case. And what about a religious objection to interracial marriage? Again, I think, so when we look at that, we would say that would likely not be permissible because the objection there is still to the race of the person. So the objection to interracial marriage is, is based on we don't want, we have this white supremacy and we don't want the black race polluting the white race. That's an objection to race. That's still impermissible. So that's why here, when Jack is free to serve, everyone serves everyone, including the complainants here, he'll serve them other types of cakes, birthday cakes, other events. His only disagreement is not to the person. His disagreement is to marriages between one and man and one woman. So for example, if you have a polygamous marriage and three people come in and want to celebrate their wedding, all heterosexuals, Jack will say no because that's not one man and, not, and one woman. So it's not based on the sexual orientation of anyone who comes in. It's based on the belief that marriage is one man Following and one woman. Following up on only. Justice Liptak's question, I think that it could be argued that the objection in the case of interracial marriage is not to the people but to the marriage and just like in this case that the objection is to the is to the wedding not to the individuals I don't see how you can differentiate the two because the difference is is am I not serving the person because of who it is or will I not engage in this expression regardless of who is asking so for example if you switch out the person asking that's a big part of the test so for example in this case um, if we have someone who comes in and says uh, I have a friend down the street who's getting married uh, it's a same-sex marriage. Will you make the cake? It's not the objection to the person that's 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 asking. So it's not based on sex orientation. But if you flip that around and, and someone comes in, a gay person comes in and says, "Can I have a, a birthday cake?" and or "Can I have some others?" The question is absolutely absolutely permissible. The, the Jack will do so. So that's why you have to be careful, even though uh, it gets conflated in the cases, that there's a difference between what the expressive event is. And if we look at, talk about a limiting principle, if we look at respondents' principle, there is none. Their principle is government can compel speech regardless of what the message is. So for example, someone comes in a shop and says, I want you to make a, 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 a cake in the shape of a white cross whether it's the local Baptist church, which is one message, or the Aryan Nation church comes in. According to respondents' argument, the baker would have to make that, uh, that cake, even though he objects to the Aryan Nation's message. If a same-sex couple came into the shop and wanted, you know, two dozen cupcakes to go celebrate a family celebration of their union, uh, would Mr. Phillips have a problem selling the cupcakes off the shelf to them? He, he would not, and in fact, he's testified in the case. He would sell them any other products, cupcakes, brownies, whatever happens. But if it's, but if it's something for the celebration of marriage, which again goes to the message, uh, that's what he wouldn't participate in. And I think that explains the difference right there, because if there was an objection to the sexual orientation of the person, he wouldn't even sell them any of the products, and that's not what's going on Mr. here. Mr. Cortman, in the record of this case, there's an affidavit from a, um, a lesbian couple who say they were refused the very product you were talking about, cupcakes, for their civil commitment ceremony. So is that not what you were just saying is not permissible? Uh, no, my understanding is, is if they want to come in, they can buy anything off the shelf. The question is if they're going to create anything custom made uh, for the same-sex celebration, he wouldn't do so. For example, so the difference in the cupcake answer is there have been weddings where people have three-tiered cupcakes. So rather than having a full cake, They'll arrange this custom-made cupcakes and the same thing as the same-sex marriage wedding cake or whatever it happens to be. He would not do that. But if they're buying something off the shelf, cupcakes, brownies, other events, um, he would certainly sell those. So that goes back to the message. It's not the particular magic of the cake, but if you're having a cake in a different form, uh, then it carries the same message. Well, let me ask this of both of you because one of the problems with this case is despite all of the interest and all of the briefs and everything that's been uh, generated, the conversation that these three or actually four people had was all of 30 seconds or so. Is it your understanding, Ms. Moore, that um, your clients would not even have been able to get a plain sheet cake if they had simply said, and I don't think this conversation took place, give us a plain sheet cake for our wedding? 
Well, you've hit the nail on the head exactly with the question, which is that we don't know whether they could have received a plane made to, you know, off-the-shelf type of product because Masterpiece Cake Shop didn't let them get that far, didn't even ask that question. And when you look at the record in the case, there's not only an affidavit put in of a, a Stephanie Schmaltz who had tried to order cupcakes for her family commitment ceremony and was told no, um, but Jack Phillips himself in his affidavit says he had refused to make a simple sheet cake with a photo transfer of two men because it would be used for their uh, wedding reception. But, so. but, but just to interrupt for a second, he didn't kick them out of the shop, right? They chose to walk out at that time, so could they not have, I mean, we just don't have the fact base to say, what if, what if they had asked for cupcakes? What if they had asked for a cake? What if they had asked for something that had no ex intrinsic message about a same-sex wedding? Do we know? You know, we don't know, but it also doesn't matter. You know, to the extent there's any message that's inherent in a wedding cake, that's a message that the bakery has already agreed to send because it's already chosen to sell its cakes to the public at large. No questions asked. It's only when you look at the identity of the customer the cake is for that they're refusing to sell the product. So it's not based on any message inherent in the product. It's based on who the customer is. So if that happens, that's discrimination. And sorry, if I may answer the second half of Judge Wolf's question. You know, the offer to sell them cookies and brownies, you know, if tr if, even if that's true, it doesn't change the fact of the matter either, right? The Colorado law requires full and equal enjoyment, right? You can't offer a second class menu or limited service. And we know this from cases dating back to 1934 when the Colorado Supreme Court confronted a case of a restaurant that refused to serve a black customer in the dining room but said, we'll serve you dinner in the kitchen. Right? And no one seriously doubts that that was race discrimination. The court easily said, this is obviously the kind of discrimination the anti-discrimination law was intended to eradicate. That's exactly what happened here. If you've got custom wedding cakes on the menu, you can't ref refuse to sell that same product to someone simply because she is gay or for that matter, black or Christian or any of the other characteristics enumerated under Colorado law. So I just wanted to um, clarify, your position is that uh, cake is never speech or when, in your opinion, would cake depicts speech? Does it have to have a message on it um, or a symbol? Is there any sort of distinction? Um, there's no distinction because I don't think it matters whether or not we think of the cake as speech. Well, what we do is we look at the Anti-Discrimination Act and we say, is this a law that's targeting speech or expression or is it instead a law that's regulating something else? In this case, commercial conduct when you're involved in sales to the general public. Because we're in that latter category, right? It doesn't matter what the substance is of the product that's sold. It could be books, it could be newspapers, it could be fine art. Um, any of those things, if you choose to make it available to the public at large, um, you can't discriminate based on those certain characteristics that have been enumerated. Well, is it, is it true, as Mr. Cortman said, that if uh, Mr. Phillips, for instance, sold a cake in the shape of a cross, uh, in the past, and a representative of a, of, a, of a hate group walked in and said, I'd like that cake for our rally, would he be compelled, under your view, to make that cake? No, because the Anti-Discrimination Act is not an all-comers law. There's no obligation to serve everyone who walks in the door. Right? The obligation is only not to refuse service based on these limited set of characteristics. characteristics and religion, by the way, religion are, is one of those characteristics? Religion is one so of those characteristics. So the Church of the Aryan Nation comes in and wants this cross-shaped cake. Then, then, then he does have to make it. If he's made the same cake in the past, and if the objection is based solely on that customer's religion, um, again, I don't think that the Aryan nations, well, we can debate whether or not it's a church, but that's irrelevant. Um, but you're right that if it's based solely on the person's protected characteristic, that's what's prohibited. I think, you know, in most examples, for example, if in the example as uh, Mr. Cortman gave it, when you've got a member of a hate group coming in, you know, membership in a hate group is not protected under the Anti-Discrimination Act. Again, there's no obligation to serve everyone who walks in the door. And I think it's important to underscore that because the, the identity-based characteristics that are enumerated all come from a history of discrimination. There is a real history of discrimination in this country and in Colorado against people based on fa factors like race, color, sex, and sexual orientation. And that's why the Colorado General Assembly chose in 2008 to extend protections to LGBT people based on that very real history. And that history is simply not present when it comes to membership in a hate group. So, so Mr. Cortman, that point is well taken. What about the fact that uh, you bring up examples such as Halloween or anti-American or sexual messages and the like. Those are not protected classes such as LGBT. Why, why is that even a, an argument on your side? Because the point of it is, is he objects to certain messages about different subject matters, so he's consistent across the board. But, but let me go back to the concession just made by respondents, because I don't want that to be overlooked. That's an incredible concession. 
what she basically just argued before this court that even if it is speech that the government can compel it. There's no case from this court that has ever held in any context, even the non-discrimination laws, even the public accommodation laws, that the government can compel, compel speech. In fact, Hurley was exactly this case, where they said, no, this is sexual orientation discrimination under a public accommodation law. And the court said, not so fast. You're compelling speech, and you're changing the message of the speaker, and it struck down the application. That's exactly what's going on here. There is no case, in fact, there's a half a dozen cases or more where the Supreme Court has held that if you compel speech, even if it is to a neutral law like this, that it strikes at the heart of the First Amendment. So we can't overlook that concession that if this cake has pictures on it or words on it or an artist has a commission painting, that just because he puts out a shingle, he loses his First Amendment protection. There's no, that's, that's boundless. Isn't the... Um Hurley case not exactly on point here. Um, the Hurley case is the case dealing with the St. Patrick's Day parade yes. in Boston and the desire of a of a gay rights group to march. Didn't, didn't in that case wasn't didn't that turn on the fact that the court found that it was a, essentially a private event and the whole point of that event was to was to express that private group's message. It, it, no, it was actually, it, it was a private event, but it was found to be a public accommodation by the state, which is exactly what was found here. So it didn't turn on the fact that it was private versus public because the court didn't overrule the fact that it was found to be a public accommodation. In fact, it said even if it is a public accommodation, we have to draw the line at this application of the law. So we have to keep in mind, no one is challenging the fact that public accommodation laws exist. It's when you then apply them too far to restrict speech or compel speech, which is what the court found in Hurley, that it's unconstitutional to do so. Mr. Cortman, I don't doubt that your client uh, thinks he's expressing a message when he makes a cake, uh, but is there not a second part to the test? Shouldn't we also look at whether people understand him to be expressing a message? I've been to weddings and I've eaten wedding cake and I've never has the thought crossed my mind that the baker of that cake was telling me something. No, it's actually not part of the test. When it comes to compelled speech, the court does not ask, well, does someone understand this to be a specific message? In fact, in Hurley, it said there was no articulable message there. A bong hits for Jesus. We don't know what the message was, but the court has held that it's still protected speech. So third-party perceptions or someone understanding the message, no. If you look at most art, I look at most art, I have no idea what, what the expression of the message is. Jackson Pollock paintings, uh, Jabberwocky, nonsense prose. Uh, it doesn't have to communicate any articulable message. And I think this is the point here. What we have to make sure is, is we strike that balance between serving everyone because of who they are, which we agree with and Jack does. But we, what we cannot do is go so far as to say that because you enter into business that you lose your First Amendment rights and you can compel not just to serve someone but speak a message that you disagree with, whether it's an artist or a painter or a sculptor, uh, as my colleague concedes. Can I hear from the other side on this? Because is it your understanding that if the wedding guests, as Justice Liptak was saying, don't get the message that the baker finds objectionable, is it your, uh, do you have a different view on that, that if they don't get that message, then uh, he doesn't have an argument there? I think Justice Liptak is referring to the second prong of the Spence Johnson test that's used to determine whether conduct is what the Supreme Court calls inherently expressive. And that's a separate thing from the compelled speech line of cases that Mr. Cortman has relied on, so I think it's important to unpack that difference. Compelled speech cases, we all know the most famous case uh, of West Virginia versus uh, Barnett, right? A school child compelled to recite the Pledge of Allegiance, where we're dealing with a state law that actually requires children to raise their right arm and salute the flag and speak certain words, right? That's the heartland free speech case. There's no question the Anti-Discrimination Act is nothing like a law of that kind. It says nothing about words, it says nothing about messages. There's another line of cases that talks about conduct that is inherently expressive. So this most famous example here would be burning the American flag. Sure, it's not words, but it communicates something. We all know what that something is. And in that context, you do look at first the subjective prong, whether the, the person um, engaged in the conduct actually intends to express a message, and then second, you know, whether anyone would understand that message, whether that, it's objectively reasonable. And I think here that second prong, you know, whatever message the bakery may intend to send when it sells a wedding cake, when you choose to offer your services when, to the public at large, you say, I'll sell this cake to any Tom, Dick, and Harry. It just doesn't communicate anything that you choose to sell it to any particular Tom, Dick, or Harry. So it utterly fails under the objective prong. 
Um, but even more importantly, even if both prongs were satisfied and the wedding cake did express a message in that way, expressive conduct still can be regulated consistent with the First Amendment. And this is where petitioner's argument really falls apart. We know this from the case of United States versus O'Brien. This, of course, is the draft card burning case. You've got Mr. O'Brien burning his draft card on the steps of a Boston courthouse to protest, protest the Vietnam War. There's little that is more expressive than that, right? But the Supreme Court says, no problem, no First Amendment violation, because the law at issue was a law that prohibited mutilation of draft cards. It doesn't care if you do it on the steps of a courthouse or if you sit in your basement with a pair of scissors and cut it up, right? It's not a law that was aimed at suppressing the kind of protest that Mr. O'Brien engaged in. It was a law that was aimed at maintaining the government's ability to administer the draft. And because of that, the court upheld Mr. O'Brien's conviction for what was undoubtedly very expressive conduct. And so even if the conduct of selling a wedding cake when you've chosen to open your doors to the public at large could be found to express a message in the same way that burning a draft card in the steps of a courthouse can, it still can be regulated consistent with the First so Amendment. So just, just so I'm clear on the, on the expansiveness of your argument as I understand it, this principle applies to all expressive pr professions, to singers, to poets, to painters, to sculptors. Anyone open for business to the public has to convey messages uh, that involve protected classes. Well, I'd quibble with uh, two premises in your question. So one is to really just underscore this nature of what it means to be open to the public. Because when we hear the parade of horribles from Petitioner, a lot of times we're talking about people like the Democratic speechwriter, who's not really open to the public at large, right? A speechwriter selectively competes for highly competitive positions, right? I choose, I say, I want to be a speechwriter for George W. Bush, and I'm going to apply to him, right? That's not someone who's opened their doors to the public at large. So that scenario simply is not covered by the Anti-Discrimination Act. But the second piece is that the Anti-Discrimination Act, it's not an all messages act, right? There's no obligation to write any particular message or every particular message that re that's requested. The only requirement is equal treatment. So if, for example, the bakery chooses to sell cakes that say, God bless this union, and it chooses to sell those cakes to members of the public at large, then yes, it can't refuse to write those same words for someone based on her protected characteristic. Of course, it's free not to offer that product in the first place, and the Anti-Discrimination Act says nothing about that. So if, if the couple, we never, as one of the earlier questions suggested, the factual record is actually quite underdeveloped, and we don't know very much about the interaction. But had the couple, they, they arrived with a binder of ideas uh, for the cakes they, they, they might like. Had the couple asked for a cake with a gay pride flag on it, uh, Jack Phillips would be compelled to make that cake, or are you saying he just has to make a wedding cake? he has to make any cake that he would have sold for another couple. And so if, for example, Jack Phillips says, I don't make rainbow cakes, I think they're tacky, or I don't stock blue dye in my shop because I'm allergic to it, fine. He, he's perfectly entitled to have that policy. But if he's going to sell a rainbow cake to a heterosexual couple, he can't refuse to sell the same product to someone simply because they're gay. But, but let's look at that, if we can, for a second. So if Jack Phillips creates a rainbow cake for the church's Sunday school class having one particular meeting, according to respondents' argument, he now has to sell that rainbow cake for the gay pride event. So what we, we, we have to watch the, the doublespeak here, because the same words, or equal service, as my colleague refers it to, is still compelled speech. But speech in different contexts has different meanings. For example, God blesses this marriage. That's exactly what respondent just argued. So if Jack says to a man and woman who are getting married, God blesses this marriage, he has to speak that message to a same-sex union. So we're not talking about is cake expressive, is cake not expressive. We're talking about words. I'm pretty sure last time I checked, they are expressive. So what respondent's argument is, is that Jack has to speak a message of God blesses this marriage because he said it in a different context. So what that means is not only can the government compel speech, but every time a painter, a sculptor, a writer, an artist is going to speak some message. They have to stop and think, who, who else could this apply to? Can this be taken out of context? Can it be used in a different way? I'm going to silence myself because otherwise, God blesses this marriage has to be used. The white cake in the shape of a cross has to be given to the Baptist church. It has to be given to the Aryan Nation church. That's an incredible principle, both content and viewpoint based, that this court has never countenanced before. Is anything about this case different uh, now than it was in 2012, meaning that same-sex marriage is now legal in Colorado, would it be, would it have been litigated any differently? 
Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it is. I mean, certainly there's a distinction which was brought up in, in the case that at the time this happened, Colorado didn't even recognize same-sex marriages. Uh, the courts below didn't think that was really an issue. We, we certainly thought it was. Uh, but even with the recognition of same-sex marriage, just like the court in Obergefell said, we have, we have good, decent, and honorable people who hold this view about same-sex marriage who are still free to advocate those views even after same-sex marriage. And so while the government must recognize it, that doesn't mean it could force private citizens to participate in that sacred ceremony. And that's what we have to remember here. This is a sacred ceremony going to a wedding. This isn't a birthday, it's not a bar mitzvah, it's not these, these other things talking about. What we have to talk about is a sacred ceremony. And I think what's important here to keep in mind is that we are not advocating for a rule that says Jack Phillips or anyone else doesn't have to serve everyone based on whatever protected categories. He does, not only does he need to, but he does in fact. The difference is, is what we don't want is this rule, like in Hurley, to be extended to say, we're gonna use these public accommodation laws that are meant for inns and, and restaurants and different things. We're gonna expand them to speech and then we're gonna force you to speak a message you disagree with under the guise of equal treatment, which is what we keep hearing here. But that's why we have to differentiate the forcing and compelling speech as this court already found in Hurley under very similar circumstances as not to carry the day. I think Hurley really is quite far afield because as Judge Sherman anticipated, Hurley involved what was fundamentally a private expressive event. And Hurley itself recognized there's no problem generally applying public accommodation laws to uh, things that are in the heartland of public accommodations. As you, Your Honor, uh, opposing counsel mentioned, things like restaurants and hotels. There's no reason why a retail bakery that's chosen to all open its doors to the general public is any different. I think the court in Hurley specifically said this is a peculiar application, right? What the Massachusetts court did there was peculiar. And there's nothing about this case that's peculiar. To the contrary, it's actually quite straightforward. Mr. Corbin, how would, if you were lucky enough to win this case, how would you like to win it? The United States argues that um, you're on the, the cakes are on the expressive side, but uh, barely so, and that limousines or venues and others would not be. Are you arguing for, a, obviously you just want to win for your client, but are you arguing for a broader rule than that? Or do you think that it is a narrow question where uh, a painting or a photograph or flowers or a cake uh, are expressive, but there are many other, uh, say, parts of a wedding that are not. Sure. Uh, I'd like to think it's not just luck if we happen to prevail, uh, but putting that aside for a second, uh, I, I think what the court needs to employ is the same free speech jurisprudence that it always has. And I think that's what we need to, so we, we hear a lot of the arguments here today, but let's look at a couple of things. There's no case that respondents can cite where this court has ever held that the government can compel speech even if it's in a public accommodation context. All of the cases where it upheld these non-discrimination statutes, the court specifically said, and every one of them cited, it didn't alter the message of the law firm, of the private club, of whoever it happened to be. Never has the court held it could compel speech even with these neutral laws and public accommodation laws. What it has held, though, in Hurley, and Dale, and Tornillo, and Pacific Gas and Electric, and Riley, and all of these cases that it's impermissible for the government to compel speech. So the answer to the question would be, it's the same test the court would always employ. Is this expressive? Some cases are a little bit difficult. Um, is, this, is this case about, is, is, a, is a wedding cake inherently expressive? Does it communicate a celebration of this wedding? We think so. But even putting that aside, the order requires and respondents argue, even if there's words on it, which I think everybody agrees is, is pure expression, God blesses this marriage, that still has to be made. So it's a pure compulsion of speech. So what the court has to do is the way it decides, is this speech, is it expressive? The way it does all the time, there's a new medium. Animal crush videos, would anyone think they were protected expression? New dancing, would people think that's protected expression? But the court has said yes, tattoos. Um, Jabberwocky, all the examples we gave. So the court would go through the same analysis to determine if this is expression. We think the cake is inherently. We certainly know pictures are. We certainly know words are, so I think that makes it easy. We know rainbow filling is. And then once it's decided that this is expression with those things, then the court has to protect it under the First Amendment. Can we just spend a minute talking about um, whose speech this is sure. in reality? Um, if I recall from the, from the record, um, the Phillips's call they talk to the, uh, their clients, they get an, in, uh, an idea of their interests, of what they want their wedding cake to say. Isn't it, aren't we looking, what really is the couple's own uh, speech and their expression of what they want to celebrate at their wedding? 
No, I think it's both, and I think that's pretty clear. You go to uh, a writer, a photographer, an artist, uh, wh whoever it happens to be, and you say, these are the ideas, this is what I'm thinking. They create the art. Um, what I would say is it's, it's at a minimum both of their speech. And in fact, Hurley, the same exact argument was brought up, and as a matter of fact, all the arguments brought up by respondents were made in Hurley and rejected. Um, but what Hurley basically said was, that's the argument made, this is, this is our speech, not yours. The court said, no, it's both of your speech. And so we still have to honor the fact that, that the person creating the speech is their speech in addition uh, to the other person's speech, but we don't discount their First Amendment rights just because they happen to host another speech or include another speech or create expression from another speech. Ms. Marr, do you agree with that? Or is the, is the cake maker merely my agent? I come in, I say, make me a cake. I'll tell you what kind of cake to make me. I think at the absolute maximum, the baker could be a conduit for its customer speech. But again, the Supreme Court has already offered us a framework to think about that scenario. In the case of Turner Broadcasting, where you've got a law that regulates cable operators, right? These are literally companies that do nothing but transmit other customers' speech. And in that case, the court said, yeah, okay, this is a law that targets the channels of communication, the conduits of speech. And what do we do? We apply the test set for in United States versus O'Brien, which I've already explained that we survive. So just because someone may be a conduit for someone's speech doesn't mean, and just because the First Amendment may be implicated, doesn't mean that therefore the government can't regulate conduct that happens to incidentally involve speech. The opposite is true. Time and again, when we apply the test in O'Brien, we see that laws that regulate conduct that incidentally affect speech or expression survive First Amendment scrutiny. There's nothing about this case that's different. Do you need uh, for us to adopt the O'Brien test in this context, or can you survive strict scrutiny? We absolutely can survive strict scrutiny, Your Honor, and as we've set forth in our brief, the Supreme Court has held repeatedly that the interest in eradicating discrimination is compelling and that laws that prohibit discrimination are narrowly tailored to serve that end. There simply is no way to prohibit discrimination except to end discrimination. That's the only way to achieve the state's objective here in equal treatment. And I think it's important to recognize the legislative record here that the Colorado General Assembly relied on in 2008 where the lead sponsor said this law was necessary to allow LGBT people, quote, to live in dignity and die in dignity in the state. That is undoubtedly a compelling interest. Mr. Corbin, one thing's always puzzled me about this case. When I tell people about it, they go, that, that baker has strong religious convictions. He has a real claim of conscience. Why isn't this a free exercise case? Why are we arguing about compelled speech and free speech issues? Well, it is both, and in fact, we've briefed both and brought both to the court, uh, and so whichever way the court would like to rule for us, we would certainly accept, but I think it is a free exercise case on several different fronts. Number one, someone who holds their religious beliefs that sincerely, that takes a 40% hit to their business because of the application of this law, that stands firm in his beliefs, and, and, and again, serves everyone, and I think that's critically important here, because when we talk about discrimination, it's about not serving someone when there is no speech involved. So we can't add speech to the equation and make believe it doesn't exist. Your Honor talked a question about an agent. I think you can hire someone to write a book for you would be considered your agent. I'm pretty sure it's still compelled speech on the agent's behalf. And I think that's extremely important. But the sincerely held religious beliefs certainly play a great part. Uh, we would be glad for the court to rule on that issue too. Uh, the speech, I think, just easily lends itself, especially because of the concession uh, by my friend on the other side, that even when you add words, and even when you add the rainbow, and even when you add pictures and figurines, which I, I believe we all agree is speech, that the government can still compel this. And again, there's no case by this court that's ever held such a thing. It seems clear, though, Mr. Corbin, that your arguments over the course of time have veered much more toward speech and expression than they have toward, um, toward uh, the religion uh, aspect of this. Can you explain why that is? Is that the stronger part of your case? And if it is, isn't the speech based on religion? The whole nature of what he's refusing to do is based on his religious beliefs. So if the religion argument is at all weak, uh, shouldn't the speech argument be seen likewise? I think, I think they're both strong, and it's just a matter of preference, is you have to choose one to brief first. Uh, so they're both briefed, they're both briefed at length, uh, length. but it, like this court held in the Reed versus Town of Gilbert, uh, there were church signs that were, that were uh, at issue in that case. And of course there was a speech issue, but was, it was an invitation to church, so there was a religious speech issue. And so both free exercise and free speech uh, were both at issue in that case, uh, but the court chose to rule on the, on the free speech issue, uh, which I think is the same or similar scenario as we have in this case. Mr. Corman, I wonder if um, I could ask about uh, someone who might be an employee of the, the bakery at the local supermarket. 
sure. who also has a sincere religious objection. What, what happens in that case if uh, someone comes in and says, I'd like you to write something on this cake that that person finds objectionable? Sure. I think what would happen in that case is I think the person would still have a free speech or religious freedom objection, whatever it was, but I think that would switch to an accommodation. So in other words, if there was a specific employee that, that did not want to create that specific message or that specific cake, whatever it happened to be, uh, then the employer would have to say, uh, can we reasonably accommodate you? That would fit under Title VII. If there were other employees that would be willing to do so, they would step in and do so. I think it's a little bit of a mystery. And so then let me take the, the, the scenario of the, the Masterpiece Cake Shop, sure. but put it in a very remote location where there isn't another uh, vendor anywhere nearby, and yet you have a, a same-sex couple looking for a wedding cake. Isn't that the situation you just described, and don't we then have a problem? No, I, I think there's there's a difference if we have, for example, uh, you know, a big a big supermarket, whatever the example was, and a particular employee refused to do so, uh, rather than the owner of the shop himself, who's expressing his uh, beliefs in his speech through whatever the shop creates. In fact, created by himself. Um, but I think that's a big difference. So I don't I don't think the test for the court uh, for whether we compel speech is geographic. Um, if we have one specific speech writer in the entire state, can we compel that speech writer, who, by the way, I understand are usually paid, uh, to write speeches they disagree with? I don't think the court would issue that as a ruling. There may be some other factors. There may be some other things come into play. Um, but I don't think this court would have a geographic limitation on, on forced speech. Ms. Marr, I wonder if I could ask you then, taking this geography question, uh, Denver's a big metropolitan area. There's all kinds of bakeries around. Why would a couple want to give their business to a shop that doesn't want to serve them when there are all kinds of alternatives, uh, perhaps even down the street? Because the issue here isn't about where they bought their cake. It's about full and equal participation in civic life. Dave and Charlie never should have had to walk into that store and be told, your dollar isn't good enough. And that's exactly what happened. It's irrelevant that bakery would have sold them something else. They went there that day to order a wedding cake, and they were told no and turned away. It doesn't matter if there are other businesses available to serve the customers. It's like saying in the 1960s that protesters who sat in at Woolworths could have gotten their sandwich at another lunch counter. But you do draw a distinction between race, issues of race, and uh, this question bef before us. Uh, I think so in the marriage context because I think one is clearly still based on the race, whereas in our situation it's not based on their sex orientation. It doesn't matter. It's the specific message of uh, a two men or two women as opposed to a man and a woman. But I think the question, I think the question is important because we have to decide whether it's geographic or not. So we have, a, we have many businesses in the area. Do we then go to one who's a graphic designer? and say, I know there's plenty of others who will, who will uh, draft and create this message for me, but I want to force you to do so even though it violates your uh, religious beliefs or your First Amendment rights. Uh, the court has never held, uh, and, and hopefully will not do for the first time, uh, to compel that person to express that message. And that's why it's a, it's a little bit different to say, I went into this shop, uh, and, and I wanted to, to, to force, let's put it in plain terms, I went into the shop, I wanted to force the person to speak a message they disagree with, and they wouldn't do so, therefore I can bring this action against them. Completely different scenario than they wouldn't serve me X. You know, I, I, I still have to return to this race question one more time because I, 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 I have to admit I don't quite understand your answer. As I understand it, you say that declining to bake a cake for an interracial couple is necessarily about race. Sure. But declining to bake a cake for a same-sex couple is not necessarily about their sexual orientation. Isn't that just assertion on your part? No, it's, it's, it's based on what the, what, the, what the marriage is or is not. People, so, have, people, people in, not very long ago had profound religious objections to interracial marriage. Sure, but, that, but that's not the justification. So we're not looking at the motivation of why. So, so it's not a free pass because you have um, a religious belief to discriminate against someone. That's not what our argument is. So if it was truly discrimination, I won't serve you. In other words, don't come in my shop because you're black or because you're gay. Even if there's a religious belief, we would say that person loses. So it's not the, the, the motivation for it. All what, all what we're saying is, is if you're compelling someone to speak a message not based on that protected characteristic, we don't then conflate the two. And here may be a, a better example that may help. I just recently found out that close to 20% of gay men and women 
still marry someone of the opposite sex to raise a family. Jack would do those weddings, even though the sexual orientation of one or two of those may, may be gay or lesbian, he would participate in that wedding because it's a man and a woman. And all my point is it shows that the sexual orientation of the people do not matter. And I think that's a, another way to explain it that shows the difference between the race question, the race matters, and the sexual orientation question in marriage where it doesn't matter. Do you want to respond? You see me chomping at the bit. <laughs> uh, we have not heard any principal distinction between racial discrimination and sexual orientation discrimination, and that's because there is none. Um, and as to this proposed distinction between being gay and you know, marrying a person of the same sex, the Supreme Court has already rejected that as a distinction without a difference in two separate occasions. First in Lawrence v. Texas when the court struck down bans on sodomy and said this is nothing more than something that is directed towards gay persons as a class. So it's a ban on conduct, but it's conduct that, let's face it, only gay people engage in, or pretty much. And the fact that you may have people on the margins who, you know, you know, marry a person of the same sex for a stunt or for tax reasons, right, that doesn't change the fact of the matter, that really when we talk about same-sex weddings, we're talking about same-sex couples. And Justice Scalia's words in the Bray case are perfectly apt here when he said, a tax on wearing yarmulkes is a tax on Jews. We all know that's what it's about. It doesn't matter if I go to a Jewish wedding and there's a box of kippahs outside the door and I put it on my head as I walk in, right, that doesn't change the fact that that tax is aimed at Jewish people as a class. And the same is true here when it comes to discrimination based on sexual orientation. Let me ask, if there was a man who dressed like a woman and was marrying a woman and came into the bakery, would that, he's still biologically a man, so would that change the factor that it would still be a man and a woman getting married? So would the, bakery, the baker then not have any sort of objection to that marriage, even though they might both look like women? I lost you. So it's, it's a, it's a, <laughs> a man who's dressed as a woman, Let's use the but the really a man. Right. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, uh, I don't watch the Kardashians. Like but. if Bruce Jenner, now Caitlyn, uh, was to stay married to Kris Jenner, and they came in and wanted a wedding cake to, to celebrate their wedding anniversary. So it's still a biological man and a biological woman. Yes. I, I think he would have no objection to that. I think he would still – I don't know this. I'm just projecting uh, because we haven't asked that. No one came up with that hypothetical before. Uh, but I, I think he would not have an objection because you have a, a man marrying a woman. But let me address the Bray case real quickly because I think this is another way to look at it. What the court held was an objection to abortion is not an objection to the class of women. Even though women are the only ones who have abortions, the court recognized that it's not an animus against the class. It's a separate objection to the abortion. It's the same exact scenario here. It's not objection to the sexual orientation because if it was, by definition, you would not serve the person. And it does matter who the person is marrying. That's the point. So it's even, even with polygamous marriages, it's the point. It's the fact that if it's not one man and one woman, sex orientation is irrelevant, whether it's a same-sex marriage, whether it's a polygamous marriage, whether the court legalizes incestuous marriage, whatever new definition they come up with, there's still going to be only a man and a woman, regardless of whatever flavors you add into that mix. So I, I think this is a good time to move into the next uh, part of the program, which is uh, closing statements by each side. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. Despite all of the arguments, there are only a few questions that matter here. First, is this case only a question of where to draw the line on what is expression? Is that what we're asking? Is a wedding cake inherently expressive in and of itself? Or does it become expression when you add words, when you add rainbow filling, when you add figurines to the top? I think the answer is yes on both, but even if you take it to the latter, where there's, it's only expression if it's words, then the question is, is do we go with respondent's new rule that even if we acknowledge that it is expression, that the government can compel that under the guise of a public accommodation law? That is a truly remarkable argument that allows to force citizens to speech, speak messages that they disagree with. Uh, it is unprecedented for the many cases that I've, I've cited before, um, and interestingly enough, precedent that includes specifically a public accommodation law that was applied in a very uh, similar circumstances. But if you look at how broad the Supreme Court has defined speech, it's certainly um, not difficult to say that a wedding cake is expressive and certainly must say that when a wedding cake adds uh, certain words to it, it clearly is expression, especially when that applies to, admittedly, writers, um, photographers, um, graphic designers, and the like. But the cake artist and the florist and the painter and the sculptor 
all of these folks, if they have this traditional view of marriage, can be forced out of their now um, current livelihoods simply because of a law that's being applied in a manner that was not intended. Should we punish those unwilling uh, to be compelled to speak a specific message merely to reach some desired end? Some end, by the way, that will reduce our nation's commitment to uh, robust free speech. Will the fine art painter be required to create an original artwork to express a message, whether it's supporting same-sex marriage or any other issue uh, against their will? Or will an atheist sign maker uh, be required to create a, stert, a church sign that says God's not dead? Because under respondents theory, that's what will be required. But there's a better way. That way is to enforce the public accommodation laws to require that people serve others simply based on their protected status, but will not um, force them to speak a message that they disagree with. And if I may close with a uh, quote from uh, this court's opinion uh, in Barnett that's specifically uh, applicable here. Freedom to differ is not limited to things that do not matter much. That would be a mere shadow of freedom. The test of its substance is the right to differ as to things that touch the heart of the existing order. If marriage is not one of those rights, is not one of those issues, I'm not sure what is. But the court closes with this. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it is that no official, higher petty, can prescribe what will be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion, or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Mark. The Supreme Court has never recognized what the bakery seeks here, a constitutional right to hang a sign in its storefront saying wedding cakes for heterosexuals only. The bakery wants us to believe that its legal claims are novel, but its arguments are nothing more than old wine in new bottles. First Amendment objections to anti-discrimination laws are not new, and they are not specific to laws prohibiting discrimination based on sexual orientation. For half a century, some businesses have claimed that religion or expression should excuse them from complying with laws against discrimination. In the 1960s, Piggy Park, a South Carolina chain of barbecue restaurants, opposed racially integrating its sandwich shops because it claimed that mixing of the races contravened the will of God. The Supreme Court found that Piggy Park violated the Civil Rights Act and called its religious defense patently frivolous. In the 1980s, Bob Jones University refused to admit students in interracial relationships because of its view that the Bible forbids the mixing of the races. And again, the Supreme Court found that the university's policy was discriminatory, notwithstanding the sincerity of its religious beliefs. And as recently as 1984, the law firm King and Spalding argued it should not have to consider women for partnership because of its right of free expression. But as the Supreme Court said then, invidious private discrimination may be characterized as a form of exercising freedom of association, which is protected by the First Amendment, but it has never been accorded affirmative constitutional protections. There is no constitutional right to discriminate. The bakery seeks to upend this well-settled rule because its cakes involve artistry. If the bakery's claim were accepted, any business could claim an exemption from our nation's anti-discrimination laws simply by characterizing its products or services as expressive. After all, cooking, like baking, involves creativity and artistry, but that does not mean that Piggy Park could refuse to sell barbecue sandwiches to African Americans. We've closed that painful chapter of our nation's history. Now we must decide whether to turn back time or to continue our progress as a country. In America, no one should be turned away because of who they are or who they love. Thank you. Thank you, Dave and Rhea. Okay, now we're gonna take some questions uh, from those of you who have joined us tonight. If you haven't already done so, you have uh, Q&A cards on your chairs and uh, Rebecca over here and Savannah over there are gathering those cards and I'm gonna start reading some of the questions now, but if you have any questions, uh, feel free to give it to these two ladies and they will give them to me. Okay, first question. How does this case affect places such as Walmart refusing to create Confederacy cakes? Uh, either one of you can take a stab at that. Sure, I can take a stab at it. I mean, again, I think I addressed this earlier, but the Anti-Discrimination Act, it's not an all-cakes act. There's no obligation to make any cake that someone happens to request of you. And in this case, uh, a business like Walmart or a smaller business is certainly free to say, 
I don't sell Confederate flag flakes. That's just not on the menu here. There's no obligation to add something to the menu simply because it's requested by someone who is white or black or gay or what have you. It's simply the obligation to offer the same goods and services. So no, this is not an all cakes act. Let me, uh, let me address that. Um, it, it's interesting um, with, in addition to the concession that the government can compel speech from the respondents, this, this same words or equal speech argument or equal services argument uh, that council just made is, is, is interesting to me uh, under the First Amendment. So for example, uh, I believe that according to that argument that if, a, if an inauguration cake was requested by a specific cake artist and it said on the cake, um, I support my president or, or the president is great, um, there's a difference between whether uh, that cake is for President Obama or President Trump. And, and my point of that is the same exact words which would satisfy the equal service or equal words argument would compel speech in two completely different contexts. Same exact words used, but the context in which it's used would change the meaning. So we would compel someone who supports President Obama, for example, to write on a cake because they had previously created that cake for President Obama, would have to create that cake saying, I love and support President Trump. And I think, again, that violates the, the free speech clause, no matter what size of the I think bakery. you've conflated two separate things there, Dave. And, and a more apt analogy might be if the bakery says, you know, I'll make a cake that says I support my president, and I'll sell it to a straight person or a white person, but not a gay person or a black person, right? Now we're talking about the same product, and the refusal is based only on who the customer is. You've changed all kind of facts in your scenario, but you haven't changed who the customer is. And that's what the Anti-Discrimination Act is intended to cure, right? The painful history of discrimination gets members of historically vulnerable groups. It's so important to underscore what we're talking about here. We're talking about the history in this nation that began with the end of chattel slavery and continues to the present day, as recently as you know the 20th century, with profound discrimination against LGBT people. I, I and don't that's what this law is intending to eradicate, not this sort of you know all cakes all the time. I don't understand that, because un in Washington, DC, political affiliation is protected status. So I don't understand how you get to discount that example when it exactly fits in your argument. And that is, is, is you can say, I, as long as I create these words, because I don't think you're acknowledging that the same words in different contexts can have different meaning. We talked about the white cross, completely different. Or what if there's a cake that says Pride March on it? And it, you go to a lesbian baker and say, fine, I'll create the, the Pride March for the, for the LGBT parade. But what happens if the Aryan Nation Church wants that same cake that says Pride March? Under your theory, they would have to create that even though the message is objectionable. It's all protected status. It's all the same speech. I'm not sure what doesn't fit under your rubric. I just wanted to pause for a minute. If you um, not only will we take your questions here, but if you want to engage in this conversation on Twitter, I hear there's a good conversation going, using hashtag SCOTUS, so feel free to tweet along as we, uh, as we engage in these, in these questions. And I also wanted to point out to both Dave and Rhea, because I feel badly for them, because they've been having to talk for a while, you both have water on the floor, if you want to <laughs> grab that at any point, because I know I would want to at this point. Okay, Rhea, I have a bunch of hypos for you. Now, these questions, this has basically already been answered in one way or the other, but I want to give uh, the audience a chance to speak. So I'm going to run through a bunch of hypos, so you can just pick which one you want to you want to answer if that works. Okay. Uh, let's see. If the government can, can compel speech, then why were dress designers allowed to deny service to our new first lady? Uh, should Muslim butchers be compelled to serve pork? Should Jewish business owners be compelled to support Nazi events? And then, let's see. Should Twitter be allowed to reject pro-life action, which is, I guess, um, I think it's a pro-life organization, from uh, paying for advertising within Twitter? All right, I'm not sure I can keep track of all those things. I, I wrote down pork and Nazis, so I'm going to start with those. Okay. Um, <laughs> when it comes to the Muslim butcher being required to serve pork, I mean, again, this comes back to this. It's not the All Cakes Act, right? There's no obligation to change the goods or services that you offer because of an anti-discrimination act. So a, a butcher might say, look, I butcher XYZ meats. This is what I've got in my shop. Um, I will butcher those meats for anyone, be they Muslim or of another faith. I don't butcher pork here, right? That's not a product that's on offer. There's no obligation to add something to the menu simply because of the Anti-Discrimination Act. In the example of the Nazis, again, we're talking about a characteristic that's not an enumerated characteristic under the Anti-Discrimination Act because, again, when we talk about discrimination, we're talking about curing a history of discrimination. Um, we're talking about uh, the history of our in our country of signs that say we don't serve your kind here, and we just don't have that history um, in the same context in the same way when it comes to members of the Nazi party. 
Uh, I, yeah, I mean, I so I, I do think, and I, I agree on this. So maybe we should we should mark this in the night where I, I agree with with something Rita said. Um, if it's not protected category, then it doesn't apply. Um, where I disagree, when you do fit in the protected category, that you have a church making a request, uh, the shape of the cross, different types of religious organizations, that's protected. Uh, when you have the pride march, uh, that's protected. When you have the rainbow cake coming from a church, uh, that's protected. So I do agree if it's not a protected category, then there is no protection under the public, public accommodation laws. But when you fit in those, such as the inauguration example, that's clearly compelled speech, and I think under that test they would be required to do so. This is a question to either of you. How much do you think this case hinges on the Supreme Court finding cake as art or expression? Well, sure, I'll go first. You know, as I said, I don't think the question here is whether or not cakes are art. Um, I think the question is whether the Anti-Discrimination Act is aimed at regulating a form of speech or expression or whether it's aimed at something more benign, and in this case, actually something quite laudable, which is eradicating discrimination. Because we can't, the government can't be in the business of deciding, you know, cakes are artistic, but uh, you know, flowers are not, or photography is not, right? All of us bring creativity and passion to our work. There's a dignity in all work. It does involve creativity and artistry. I certainly think my work does, and I think Dave's does as well. Um, so that's not the question. And a lot of expression, too. <laughs> right? That's not the question. And as we know from the Hishon case I referenced earlier, right, law firms, too, can be subject to anti-discrimination laws, even though we're in a business that we all think is highly creative. Right? The question isn't the product that we're selling. It's whether the law is aimed at regulating the content of that product or whether instead it's aimed at some sort, something else, in this case, the commercial conduct of sales. And that's what doesn't offend the First Amendment. So uh, maybe the second time, I'll agree with the last sentence. I think it is correct that the law is aimed at eradicating discrimination, and I think that's a laudable goal. I think where we get into the problem is when it's applied to compel speech, that's where the problem runs. The answer by, uh, by Rhea is, well, compel it anyway. Just because it's, we're, we're using these neutral laws, even though it happens to affect speech, let's compel it anyway. So the fact that the government can't be in the business of deciding what's expression or what's not, well, they better be. Because the Supreme Court has said the government can't compel expression. It's their job to make sure that they're not infringing on the First Amendment when they're trying to regulate otherwise conduct. But when it's clear it is expression, such as the words, the writers, all those type of things, then it's also very clear that the government cannot compel that expression, even under an admirable law such as these. I also just want to say if you're tuning in with us via live stream on the museum page or ADF ADF. Facebook page. Feel free to shoot your questions and we may get one of yours up here as well. And again, uh, feel free to join in the conversation on Twitter using hashtag SCOTUS. Okay, next question. Uh, I'm going to read the question. I'm going to provide a brief bit of context for those who think this is not real. <laughs> okay. Should Jack have to bake a birthday cake for Satan if he bakes birthday cakes for other religious groups? The context to this is that uh, Jack actually has received a couple of orders recently from, I think it's called the Church of Satan. Uh, there's this push right now among them to um, uh, reach out to various cake designers to create these cakes, and, and they have said that if they do not create these birthday cakes, that they will file a complaint with the local Civil Rights Commission. So it sounds a little silly, but this is a question, and it is, <laughs> it is one that I think warrants an answer. Well, I don't think there's any obligation to make a birthday cake for Satan. Again, Satan is not a characteristic protected under the Anti-Discrimination Act, just like you can say, you know, I don't make cakes celebrating, you know, any president, or I don't make cakes with the word God on it, or I don't make cakes with my own name. The masterpiece could say, I don't make cakes, say, Jack Phillips, fill in the blank, because I just don't write those words, right? All of that is perfectly fine under the Anti-Discrimination Act. Good Dave agrees. Okay. Not sure we, Satan had a birthday, so. We've, ad we've addressed the Satan question. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, for both of you, what is uh, the worst case outcome? So in your opinion, representing your clients, obviously, what do you see as the worst case outcome of this case? I'll let Dave take this one first so I get the chance to respond. I keep going first, <laughs> trying to be nice, and then, you know, Dave gets the last word. No problem. Uh, I may get the last word anyway. Um, no, I, I think one of the, the worst case scenarios, I'm so... The reason I think the, the, the way that Rhea elucidates the argument is, is very, very important because there's a difference between saying, is a particular cake expressive enough? I think that's fair. First Amendment scholars on both sides are struggling with that issue. Is that wedding cake inherently expressive? Some people say it is, some people say it's not. I think that's fair. Uh, what, what worries me, though, is saying, okay, we acknowledge there's expression. We acknowledge God blesses this marriage is written on the cake. You have to make it. Um, so we're acknowledging it is expression. And then the Supreme Court saying that you can compel that. 
I think that's a dangerous precedent, not only for our clients, but for everyone across the country, um, because that then opens up the government being able to tell all kinds of artists and people who, who write expression, words, books, whatever have you, calligraphers, uh, graphic designers, to say now you have to speak a message you disagree with, which I don't think any case, and I still haven't heard one, this court has ever held out to be so. That to me is the worst case scenario and, and, and very dangerous for it to do so uh, uh, for the first time. I think any loss here is a worst case scenario because the bakery's arguments apply equally to all kinds of anti-discrimination laws, laws that prohibit discrimination based on race, based on religion, based on disability. We still haven't heard a principled distinction for why that the bakery's theory would allow discrimination against gay people because of sexual orientation, but not against, for example, interracial couples because of race. And that should be terrifying. But I also want to underscore that even just the discrimination that happened in this case is too much discrimination, right? Any discrimination is too much discrimination. And even if there were a way for this case to be limited to the context of discrimination against gay people, that too is profoundly harmful. What it means to be gay in America today is to constantly be evaluating, can I be who I am here? Can I hold my husband's hand? Can I kiss him goodbye when I get off the train? Is it safe here? And all of those questions are brought to the forefront when a business turns you away because of who you are and says, your kind is not welcome here. That's exactly the harm that Dave and Charlie experienced. And that in and of itself, to me, is a worst case scenario. I'd love to. Um, again, this is not because of who you are. It's a distinction that continues to be conflated because it's the only argument the other side has. But if we can look beyond that, just like Hurley did, in fact, that argument was made in Hurley and they said, look, this, this rejection from the parade was based on their sex orientation. Same exact wording. The court said, no, there's a difference between separating the message that the, the, the glib contingency has and objecting to who they are as a person. And all we're saying is that's the same distinction uh, that the court should make as it did in Hurley. And again, I just have to point out the Supreme Court has twice rejected the distinction between the conduct of having gay relationships and being gay. I know I mentioned Lawrence earlier, then the second case was Christian Legal Society versus Martinez, when the court explicitly said the words, we have declined to distinguish between status and conduct in this context, speaking of gay people. So that argument has been made. It's lost twice. The same is true today. So we have time for two more questions. I'm going to read one of them right now. Uh, this one's for Rhea. Rhea, if Islam, Judaism, and Christianity teach uh, beliefs about marriage as a man-woman union, what is the trajectory of, of those folks as artists and creative professionals within the wedding context. Absolutely. Well, first of all, I want to point out that the Anti-Discrimination Act actually does prohibit discrimination based on religion. So I think the Anti-Discrimination Act has an important role to pay in actually keeping people of faith in the public square. But to the extent that there may be some individuals and some business owners who experience a conflict between their beliefs and generally applicable laws, you know, the Supreme Court has already struck the proper balance and said that when you have a law that's generally applicable and it doesn't target religion, it doesn't violate the free exercise clause. And so a great example of this, 1982, case of United States versus Lee. You have a member of the Old Order Amish who says that his religious beliefs prevent him from paying Social Security taxes on behalf of his employees, right? That's sincerely held. No one doubted that that was sincerely held. And the court says, yeah, but look, this is a generally applicable tax scheme. And the fact that this is going to make it harder for you to run your business consistent with your faith doesn't violate the First Amendment. And so there's nothing about the Anti-Discrimination Act that's different from a generally applicable law that, say, requires folks to pay Social Security taxes on behalf of their employees. So we've already struck that balance. Any thoughts? Yeah, I think it's uh, obviously religion is protected. Um, wasn't in this particular case uh, because I think when you match up uh, the three other bakeries that were involved in the facts of this case, it's, it's apples and apples. They're the same exact thing, yet the commission came to do different conclusions. That one is based on protected status, the other one is not, and one of those with the protected status of religion. So I do believe it's protected, but I think they're being applied uh, inconsistently, which raises some issues. Okay, last question for both of you. If the application of this law is upheld against Jack, how far does this go, and can other creative professionals be compelled to speak messages they disagree with? I know we've been going over this a lot, but I'll just leave it at that and then we can close. <laughs> so again, the question here is whether you choose to offer goods and services to the general public. Colorado has a compelling interest in eradicating discrimination. doesn't matter if what you're selling happens to involve words. That's not what the statute is aimed at. It's not aimed at suppressing speech or expression, right? It's aimed at ensuring equal treatment for all in the marketplace. A problem with a very real history in this nation. Answer the question is yes. Everybody who engages in any type of in expression in their profession uh, better beware. Okay, would you join me in thanking Dave and Rhea, Adam, Mark, Rich, and Alex. 
Well, thanks to you all for what I thought was a, a very helpful debate. And if you would like to join us, there are drinks and food uh, in this room to my left. And we hope you'll stay and continue to talk. Thanks. <laughs>